Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be in conversation with Romila because she's a friend and a fellow traveler. And most important of all, in these times, we value the historian who does not fabricate history and accuse others of distorting history. I do want to preface our conversation by saying that I'm here as an interested citizen, a writer, and I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar. So scholars in the audience, please don't expect a scholarly conversation. What we are hoping is to talk about the past in so far as it's used in the politics of the present. So Romila, let's, let's plunge in and you know, when we used to be told that, tell me what your classic is, and I'll tell you where you come from. If I adapt that a little and say, tell me what your way of looking at the past is, and I'll tell you where you come from in the present. You know, I'm putting it in this fashion, but really, of course, we're talking about different ways of looking at the past you use in the present. Would you like to start with that? Um, thank you, thank you, Geeta. Uh, it's, it's an absolute delight to be here, to have this conversation. Uh, now can you hear me? All right. I was just saying it's an absolute delight for me uh, that I'm having this conversation with Geeta because we often have conversations but in the privacy of her living room and my living room and I think this is the first time that we're chatting with each other with an audience. <laughs> so um, you're into something very private uh, which uh, I hope will amuse you and entertain you and perhaps to some little degree also give you an understanding of what we're all about. Now, Gita asked me about uh, history, and I don't really know where to begin because it's a subject that one has read and taught and, and thought about so much. Um, but yes, uh, let, me, let me clarify one thing that one often, I often get people coming up to me and saying, you're a historian and there are so many controversies these days. Where is the truth? And I have to say, I'm very sorry, but we are not looking for the truth with a capital T. Uh, as, or certainly in my case, as a historian, what I'm really looking for is how we understand the past. What happened in the past, how do we analyze it, how do we understand it? And that's really as far as I'm willing to go. I'm not into this question of looking for any truth anywhere or trying to reconstruct the reality because I don't think we can. The past is past and it's over and done with, we cannot reconstruct it as it was, but we can try and understand it, and that is really the important issue. But Romila, if I may interrupt you, um, after all, the way in which you frame the study of history, I think of uh, my own school days, where they didn't call it Indology, though that was really what was Indian history. But we had something quite nasty called Oriental history. Uh, so if we look at 
the various ways in which it's been framed. And before we get to all those ages, the golden age and the, the Mughal period, age, which the current age hits, but also, of course, even before that, the court chroniclers. So as we say today, historians, the official historians have always had an agenda. Indeed, they've always had an agenda, which was not recognized early on, but that is the first question that we ask today. When we pick up a text, whether it is a Sanskrit chronicle from the pre-Islamic period, whether it is a Persian chronicle, the first question we ask is, we read the text and we say, what is the agenda of the author? Uh, these are new questions. Who is the author? What is the agenda? What is the purpose of the text? And very important, who is the audience that the author and the text is addressing? Um, and this gives you some idea of the complications now of looking at texts as sources. You don't go to them and say, in such and such a text, it says this, this must have been what happened. Not at all. Your next question is, in such and such a text, it says this, did it actually happen? And how do we test whether it happened? And this is very important. And here, yes, the agenda does govern the reading of a text. We originally had ori orientalists, we had Indologists, who did first-rate work in finding the texts, in analyzing them up to a point linguistically, and in giving us the information from the texts. Then the agenda changed to, we're not satisfied only with information, but we now want to know what is the approach of the author, what is the purpose of the text. And so you had a whole tradition of colonial historians who wrote at great length about the purpose of these texts and made certain statements. And some of these sta statements were disapproved of by the nationalists. So you had nationalist historians who questioned what the colonial historians had said. And then came along my generation that said, wait a minute, the colonialists and the nationalists are both making mistakes. They're not reading the texts the way we would like to read them. And so we gave a fresh reading to the text, putting it into context. Um, and that has done something very interesting, which the general public is not really fully aware of. It has shifted history from being a subject in Indology where all you want is information, to becoming a subject in what we call the social sciences, where you want more than information, you want to know the how and the why and the wherefore of events, you want to analyze these events, you want to look at the context, and you want to look at causal relationships and logical reconstruction. Suppose you give us a, a specific example, you know, of your, I'm not going to say school of historians, but say the, the rational social science method uh, that you are not going to pretend you can uh, reveal the past, but you can sort of put in pieces and say, this is possible. So would you give us a specific example? You know, we've, uh, we have some of our favorite uh, discussions about Manu Smriti and so on, but any example that comes to mind? Well, I think the one in which I explored this the most was my study of Somnath, Mahmud of Ghazni's raid in 1026 on the temple of Somnath, where he looted the temple. And uh, according to the Persian chronicles, which were the only sources that were used for a very long time, uh, there were descriptions of the temple and what was raided. Uh, very interesting that each chronicle changed the description of what was there. One said it was a shivalingam, another said it was a pre-Islamic Arabian goddess in a, in a formless form. Um, somebody else said it was something else and so on. They couldn't quite make up their minds what it was that 
Mahmud of Ghazni has re had raided, except for the basic fact that the temple was very wealthy and they raided it for its wealth. All right. Then some of us came along and said, what about what happened after the raid? So we started looking at Sanskrit texts, Jain texts, uh, um, studies, histories, chronicles of the Chalukya dynasty of Gujarat, of individual rulers and so on, and Sanskrit inscriptions. And a totally different story emerged, which was that Somnath became a major commercial center, trading with the Arabs and the Persians. The temples were even richer than before and had a lot of land to their name, so that when the Arab traders came and wanted to build a mosque, the Somnath temple actually donated some land to them. And this is what, 150 years after the, the, the raid. Um, so, this was a revelation. And why did people not look at the Sanskrit texts? Because the British colonial writers had divided Indian history into the Hindu period, the Muslim period, and the British period. And they said the Hindu period ends in 1200, then the Muslim period begins. And in the Hindu period, you only read texts in Sanskrit because it's a Hindu period. And in the, in the Muslim period, you only read texts in Persian because of the Muslim period. Now, not realizing that the texts and the writing of texts and the writing of inscriptions continued in Sanskrit and Persian, but in Sanskrit right up till the 19th century. And not surprisingly. So one had to use this kind of information. And once this information came in, one stopped talking about the Hindu-Muslim crisis and began to look at the temple and the commercial relations and what was the nature of these commercial relations, who were the merchants who came and what was the nature of trade, who did they mix with, who did they marry, et cetera, et cetera. And the Arabs, as we now know, set up as commercial settlers along the West Coast. They set up a series of communities where they married locally and a new community emerged. Then somebody said, what about the Hindu trauma? Because the colonial writers had said a great deal about how Mahmud of Ghazni's raid created a Hindu trauma, which was so uh, strong that it became the basis of Hindu-Muslim antagonism for centuries to come, starting in the 11th century. And I went through all the texts. I could find no reference to it. There's no reference even to the raid, in fact. Um, they describe the destruction of the temple in various other ways. And then suddenly, I chanced upon a debate in the House of Commons, 1842, in which a member in the House of Commons, the British Parliament, asks a question and says, did this raid not create a trauma amongst the Hindus? And then the colonial writers picked this up and started talking about how it created a trauma amongst the Hindus. Then the nationalist historians picked it up and also started saying it created a trauma amongst the Hindus. And that, that brings us to present times. And that and brings us to present uh, times. Romila, two things from what you've um, uh, been talking about. One is, of course, the, uh, that colonial division of the Hindu period and the uh, Muslim period, to say nothing of the golden period, which I personally loathe. So I think we should refer to that as well. That has made it possible today to, um, ironically, the so-called nationalists today actually are using a, a, a colonial schema. That is one. And then the stroma you speak of also seems to have some link with the this narrative of Hindu victimization that we are getting all the time. You know, that Hindus have to get martial. That's always been the right-wing narrative. So yeah. if you could. Um, yes, well, it's um, the, 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 the um, sorry, what was your the first question? Yeah, the division into Hindu uh, yeah. period and Muslim. You know, the thing one has to keep in mind is, uh, if I can go back a little bit, 
is that nationalism is something that comes in the modern period. We cannot talk about nationalism in the Mauryan period, in the Gupta period, in the Chola period, in the Mughal period, and so on. Absolutely not. Nationalism is a modern concept, and it's a way of binding a people together and creating a nation. What existed before was kingdoms and states, but not nations. Nations come into existence in about the 18th century. Now, what happens with nationalism, in, in, in our case, we had anti-colonial nationalism, which was a kind of secular nationalism, uh, which uh, included, it was inclusive, it tried to bring all Indians together in a movement which was to try and get rid of colonial rule. Now, side by side with that, and encouraged by colonial rule, was what we call religious nationalism. And it took its root in the Muslim League yes. for Islamic nationalism and the Hindu Mahasabha, which was Hindu nationalism. Now, religious nationalism is very different from secular nationalism, anti-colonial nationalism, because anti-colonial nationalism is inclusive. It brings everybody in as much as possible. Whereas religious nationalism is catered to a particular religious community. It's confined, it's exclusive. It only relates to that one religious community. Therefore, there's a fundamental difference. Now, history is absolutely an essential feature of all nationalism. Uh, the great uh, European historian, Eric Hobsbawm, has a lovely uh, statement on this. He says, history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium addict. It is the source. It is the source of trying to think of uh, how to bring people together. And because of that, because of the centrality of history, very often what happens is that your religious or your linguistic, um, uh, or these days caste nationalism, tends to create new histories, fantasy histories. And these are playing havoc, of course, with the, the uh, genuine history, genuine in the sense that the well-researched, well-thought-out history based on hard evidence. As against that, you have these histories which are more myth than history, um, and they play this kind of role. Now, this is where, of course, in our kinds of societies, history becomes a very central issue. Um, I've often thought about the fact that <clears throat> when I went in to study ancient Indian history, this was the middle 1950s, everybody used to say, oh, you've taken the easy way out because nobody knows about that history, you can say what you like. Now I find it is the most contested history. It's precisely, it's uh, the nationalist uh, tradition of having to have a golden age. And so in the Indian case, you were hunted around for a golden age and then you located the Gupta period as the golden age. Um, this is very essential. All nationalist histories have a golden age. With Europe, it's, of course, the Greco-Romans and so on. Um, so these kinds of issues come in. And one of the problems is, is, of course, that those of us that are trying to bring in the importance of evidence, reliable evidence, evidence that has been analyzed, uh, evidence where causal relationships have been examined very deeply, which are based on rational, logical connections that are made, we are regarded as anti-national because we don't uh, further the fantasy histories that are being put forward. But Romila, let me, let me um, complicate matters hmm. because uh, it seems to me there are huge uh, chunks of absences. Um, I know that all of us would like 
to say that the uh, freedom movement was inclusive and I suppose, you know, in relative terms it was. But of course, we're talking of uh, a history where huge chunks of people are absent because of the caste system. We won't even get into women for the moment, but you know, the caste system sort of takes care of that. So uh, how, how do you, I mean, the golden period, of course, you remember we were talking about this and you said that is when you have the first um, mention, mention of, of, of caste. Uh, uh, so much for the golden period. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps if we could talk both about that and then if we are going to talk about how do we do a, 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 a nationalism today in, in the good sense of the word as citizens of this place, uh, how do we fill up those gaps? Because till uh, Dalits and huge uh, sections of the population have a history of their own, you will have Bhima Koregao. Yeah. Mm? No, I, it, th this is a very important point because uh, nationalist history tended, not all nationalist history, but a lot of it, tended to go by what the texts were saying. So if the Dharma Shastras are describing society in a particular way and giving much more publicity to the upper castes, uh, there was a tendency for historians to say, yes, that is how society functioned. And part of the reason for the absence is that those that were not literate didn't produce texts. And so we have to look for evidence of them from the texts of elite groups and upper castes who may mention them. Some do, but not at great length. So there is a certain amount of evidence that is in a direct way missing, but has to be discovered and found. And that is one of the things that is happening. Um, for example, uh, the oral tradition was always dismissed by historians as being impossible. It's inexact, it's indirect, we don't know. Anybody can add anything they like. And this became um, a little matter of debate when we discovered that there are many texts that we take for granted where bits and pieces have been added on. And we don't know who added them on, but we can suspect who has added them on because of the message they carry. See? I mean, the Mahabharata is a beautiful example of a text which is constantly being added on to in the past. So then gradually people elsewhere started studying the oral tradition. In Africa, for example, it was said, oh, there was no history south of the Sahara. But when they started studying the oral tradition more analytically and more carefully and started making a method for the study, and method is crucial in any kind of study, you see. So we have a historical method now that we use, but in the oral tradition too, they started producing a method. So now it is possible for us to go to um, non-elite sources and even use the oral tradition in terms of getting some idea of what the history might have been. And uh, when you're talking about these other, it's also the category. You, uh, the subaltern didn't really work in terms of including uh, a, a, a more of the lower castes yep. within the historical uh, right. world and and why do you think that is I mean what were the limitations of this um, concept of the subaltern very brief digression uh, well it's a brief digression that will get me into a lot of trouble with the subaltern <laughs> <laughs> the thing to remember is that they took their cue from the writings of Gramsci the prison notebooks and Gramsci used the word subaltern as a surrogate for proletarian but it caught on as subaltern, and people who then picked up his writing treated subaltern as a level just above the proletariat. See? So that is the way it comes to be used. The second problem is that initially, uh, the historians that were doing subaltern studies tended to use English language sources. They then switched to regional language, but initially there was much more emphasis on English language sources. 
And we all know that the English language sources of the last 200 years do come not from subaltern groups, exactly. but, but from elite exactly. groups. Exactly. So that also made a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, the, the uh, insistence later on of doing field work and actually going in and living and collecting data from the communities that they were working on began to make a change. But by, by that time, subaltern history was beginning to fade away and there are new schools of history that had come in. But Romla, if I may stay with caste a little bit, mm. because I think um, that here it is actually important to go back to the past and since you know, you're the perfect person to tell us, what are the ways in which this completely extraordinary system of stratification, which is our negative contribution to the world, like apartheid from South Africa, what were the strategies that actually allowed them to make this an institution which has lasted forever and is well and alive today? So that inherited pollution, the lack of mobility, you know, mm -hmm. if, you could, if you could tell us in this modern historian's um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, Paradigm. It's, it's perhaps a little difficult because it's still being worked out. So um, I'd make two points. One is that all societies have stratification. So it's not very unusual that Indian society also mm -hmm. had stratification. Yes. The second point I'd like to make is that all stratifications are subjected to being changed. So the old idea that we had that caste as Varna, as described in the Dharma Shastras, was uh, something that made society static and was always observed, come rain or come shine. This is completely untrue. We have enough historical evidence now to say that within each of the four Varnas, for example, there were very substantial changes going up and going down. So we really have to relook the whole caste stratification and see what these changes were. The second point I'd like to make is that there's always been this contention between Jati and Varna. And Jati was always treated as a subcaste of Varna. But now people are beginning to ask the question, say if we say that the original stratification was Jati, based on uh, extended families, clan systems, all, all these early forms by which society was divided. And Varna then came in as a very deliberate design and strategy to demarcate groups of people from each other. So the two things are different. They, they play along in a different way. All right. Now, the interesting thing about um, what is called Avarna, Exactly, I was just uh, waiting for you to get to that. Yeah. Savarna mm. is, of course, the, uh, the four castes that, are, that constitute Varna. Avarna is the group that is not given a status in caste and which is outside society. Um, we have very interesting references to, for example, the Chandala, who was the characteristic person who was regarded as the Avarna. Accompaniment. Uh, the Chandal always lived outside society, but in the beginning, not so much. He was regarded as low caste, and that was it. Uh, there's a very interesting dialogue in the Mahabharat, for example, where um, the, the sage Vishwamitra, who's been performing tapasya like mad because he's trying desperately to you know, acquire so much merit that he becomes a major sage. There's a famine in the land. He's desperately hungry. He comes to a Chandal hamlet. I think this is intermission. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think we could quieten that? Anyway, 
there's this there's, there's a terrible famine and Vishwamitra comes to the hamlet of the Chandals. And one of the houses, he sees um, dog meat hanging, the meat of a dog. And he's just about to grab it, to eat it. He's so hungry that the Chandal comes out and says, wait, what are you doing? If you eat that meat, you will lose all the punya of your tapasya that you have been gathering by doing this very intense tapasya. And there's a dialogue in which the Chandal is explaining or telling off Vishwamitra and saying, this is not Brahman dharma. This is not how you're expected to behave. And explains to Vishwamitra why he's saying that this is not the way he's expected to behave. Finally, of course, Vishwamitra eats the dog meat and then says he will double up on the tapasya and get back his merit. Now, the interesting thing is that in the Mahabharata, you have this little dialogue. This would be unheard of in the Gupta period and certainly unheard of today. But there is this dialogue, so there's some kind of communication, something happening. This is very disturbing. Anyway, um, and the, the situation of the Chandal living outside the settlement. Uh, I think these conversations are best had in a, <laughs> in a quiet space. I'm so sorry, you must be getting disturbed as well. Are we losing our trend of thought as well? No, it's all right. All yeah. right. Okay. Uh, uh, so by the Gupta period, we have a very interesting description from a Chinese Buddhist pilgrim who visits India. And he says that they have a category of people whom they regard as very polluted. Now remember the Mahabharata story isn't talking about the pollution of the Chanda. Now they have a category of people who are very polluted and um, when they come into town, they live outside the settlement. When they come into the settlement, they have to strike a clapper. Uh, to make a sound so that people who are there will move away from them because they're very polluted and they don't want to be touched or they don't want to touch the chanda. Okay. And it's in, in the Gupta period also that you begin to get references to, in the Dharma Shastras, you get references to what are called the asprishya, not to be touched. And that was the point that I was making, that this is your golden age. And a la an age where lots of admirable things are happening, whether it's literature or art or philosophy, or certainly something that is a, is a remarkably uh, brilliant age. But on the social side, this is happening. And my question has always been that what kind of society was it that allowed the two things to coexist. This I haven't understood, I must confess. They couldn't, um, I, I remember when you told me that they couldn't leave. So mm. um, yeah. it's not as if they could say, well, uh, I'll get up treated and go. badly here, I'll get up and go, yeah. which is, you know, uh, religious persecution has yeah. Seen waves of people going elsewhere, but caste. Yeah. Um, well, no, they couldn't get up and go for the simple reason that they were regarded as genetically polluted. That is not the individual polluted, but the child that is born of these two Asprisha parents is automatically polluted. So there's a genetic pollution. And the thing about the early period of Indian history was that there were no peasant revolts as such, unlike China that had lots of peasant revolts. We had peasant migrations. The, the peasants were overtaxed, impoverished. They would get up and move off into the next kingdom. And this was something that was always feared by the kings because they said, we lose revenue. The peasants move off and so on. Um, but the the uh, un untouchable, the Chandal, could not move because no other kingdom would accept the person. 
the person was polluted, therefore other kingdoms didn't want to increase their population of polluted people. So that in a sense, um, this category of people who were at the lowest occupational level, both in terms of artisanal production and in terms of being agricultural labor, were forced to remain where they were and they couldn't move away because of the stigma of pollution. And in some ways, I suppose it's a, a very astute method by which you have a permanent body of labor available that you can completely control. But what about um, you know, the medieval, <coughs> the, the, the bhakti movements and so on, where you had um, a, a limited but you know fairly powerful uh, protest movements, experiments with uh, fighting caste, and this whole system of co-option. I mean, of course, the perfect example is uh, Basava and, and and what happens with the Lingayat caste. Uh, so, is that always been? Uh, would you say, as a historian, a, a kind of a strategy that? Uh, you see in quote-unquote Hindu history? Well, you see it in all religions here because the interesting thing is that this category of polluted people is not restricted to the Hindu religion. You know, yes. it occurs amongst the Muslims, it occurs amongst the Christians, it occurs also amongst the Sikhs. They also have a category that they regard as polluted. Now, the question that then has to be asked is, um, the question then that has to be asked is, first of all, was this a religious movement or was it a social movement? Or was it a mixture of the two, as I think? You know, one using the other, one giving strength to the other. Um, and uh, uh, if, you, if you argue that, then it partly explains why even imported religions who are not using this idea outside are using it in India because they're continuing the social basis of what is going on in India at that time. Um, and I think that that is uh, an important category to, to, to keep in mind, that there is this continuation Roman, I want to change tracks a little. I was hoping to talk about myth and literature also, but of course we have to give the audience a chance to ask you questions as well. Um, I thought we would come to the present quite clearly and talk about, not romanticize about our great secular tradition and so on, though there is in fact a materialist uh, tradition and the word tradition itself is a bit of a problem and I was hoping we'd talk about it. But perhaps we could talk about the role of the public intellectual, the role of uh, university spaces, educational spaces, and combined with that, what sort of public discourse should we aspire to? Because that seems to me a huge problem we have today when talking about history, literature, culture? Yes, I think, I mean, when I look back, <clears throat> God knows I have enough years to look back on, 60 at least. Uh, after independence, there was this very strong feeling of <clears throat> what is the kind of society that we're going to build. There, there were the two issues that were very important. One was who are we as Indians? Uh, what is our identity? And the other was, what is the kind of society we're going to build? Among other issues, these two stand out in my mind, at least. And it was quite clear that who are we as Indians? We are Indians on a larger scale because we are not divided up into religious categories or caste categories or linguistic categories. We are citizens. The new thing was that we have a nation, we have a nation state. And we have citizens, and the relationship now has to be that of the citizen to the state, which in a sense cuts out all these other um, incisive categories that make people go apart. And of course we didn't achieve that as much as we tried, obviously because we've arrived at a state where 
Nobody talks about citizens anymore. Everybody talks about majority communities and minority communities, which is entirely a colonial construct, is entirely anti-democratic because in democracies, you don't have permanent majorities and minorities. The majority and the minority changes with each issue. So there is that distinction. Um, but the important thing, in a way, is the whole question of how do we make all our people learn to think? Because that's essential. And this is where I think education has really totally failed us. Because what it's done is, yes, it may have spread literacy up to a limited degree, uh, though even that is now being... But when education itself is a, uh, is a, a troubled site today, um, yeah. you know, it's all very well to say education, but if you suddenly have people turning around and saying, drop the uh, Mughal period altogether, uh, or that uh, uh, Darwin was wrong. Uh, I mean, we get new indices every day. Yeah. But that is partly because in our educational system, we don't do the one basic thing that all good education systems require. That is to teach the student to ask relevant questions, to doubt what is being given. And to argue that I will accept the existing knowledge, but I have the right to advance this knowledge by questioning it. Once you do that, you have a different mindset. If you don't do that, you have a mindset which says, it says that in the book, you learn it by heart, you repeat it. And the crisis today, I think, for students in school and in college is that they're not battling with ideas, they're battling with grades. What grades will I get? That is the only question that they ask. And I think that that is tragic because in a sense that is the termination of a good educational system when you stop grappling with ideas. But I, I think of uh, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, with whom, I mean, you've been associated with the university, I think, since it was founded with a particular vision uh, that all of you worked very hard to implement, that there would be this questioning. And in fact, even today, you still see the uh, residue of that, students who speak up. But what do you do with institutions that quite systematically suppress this quite natural desire to question? Um, what? What should uh, writers and students and academics, what, what do we do? Well, I think that we have to question the right of those institutions that are trying to um, reduce us to silence. That is really very necessary. I mean, I don't mean that, you know, we go out and, and uh, uh, indulge in violence and that kind of thing, but I think that central issue of questioning the right of institutions to determine silencing other institutions or diverting them in a way in which they become ineffectual. That right has to be exercised. And this is really where the whole question of the public intellectual becomes very important because it's a right which is not to be exercised only in the university. It must have a social banking, backing. And it will only have a social backing if, in fact, people, the public, understands what the issues are. If people understand that if you're converting your universities really into uh, non-entities, why are we paying all this money for university education? We want university education which is an education that teaches us how to question, how to think, how to move knowledge ahead, whatever knowledge it may be. But if there are institutions stopping that, then we have to question those institutions. I think that's, that's a good point at which to stop that really all of it comes together uh, with the point of knowledge and how do you seek knowledge. It's not something which is ready-made and there are a few people hold, but it's, it's something we're all working towards, whether it's 
in the imaginative uh, world or in the social science world. Uh, do we, shall we take a few questions uh, in a cluster and then um, are there any? Yeah. Yes, uh, we're going to privilege the young ones, but you have to be clear and loud and brief. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm a literature as well as a history student. And uh, one of the discussions we recently had uh, while uh, sitting in college uh, was, that, was a question relating to subjectivity. Um, me and my friend were talking about how, since we live in a digital age today, um, will uh, subjectivity no longer be a problem in the sense everything's recorded? And we couldn't come to a conclusion uh, since uh, she talked about how uh, even when you film something, that's always from your perspective and what you choose to film, right? So, but I thought that compared to the earlier periods, now that we live in a digital age, there'll be somewhat less subjectivity. So, yeah, that's what, that's my question. Um, of course there is subjectivity. One doesn't deny that. I mean, every, every text you read, every book you read is a subjective statement, bound to be. Um, what you're trained to do as a historian is to say, what is the statement behind what is being said? In other words, you read the book and you read it as a subjective statement. And you then have to go into uncovering what might have been the context from which this subjective statement came. Now, this is a, a difficult thing to do because uh, it's all right in today's day and age, if you're writing something on a novel that was published, say, 50 years ago, you know the context. It's, but if you're writing something on, on a, a play that was published in the 7th century AD, you, you're not that familiar with the context. But the point that I'm making is that subjectivity doesn't mean that you simply take what is said and say, that's the way it was. You use your own mind to analyze that subjectivity and try and discover where it has come from. It's tough. It's not easy. It's very tough. But it's got to be done in the best of scholarship. You're not convinced. No. Why are you not convinced? Um, uh, do you want a response? Ma'am, do you want a response? Okay. Else. Shall we come back to you? If uh, nobody else is asking questions, there's yeah, lots of people can. waiting. Uh, let's, let's be equal. There's a young man here. Yes. Yes. shirt who's anxiously standing. Yes. Go ahead. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, we have high respect for two of you for a secular face. And my question is this. Uh, how can we safeguard uh, the history of our country when it is uh, being distorted and uh, rewritten in a monolithic way? What's your advice to the youth of India in that sense from your experience? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, you have to question why it's being distorted, hmm? which means that each time a fantasy statement is made, you have to go into that question and discover what the evidence actually says and confront people with that evidence. The point about fantasy statements is that they generally are not based on evidence. They're based on whatever the person who's making the statement may think or imagine. So the evidence part of it is extremely important, especially in relation to history. Someone says that this happened or didn't happen. Uh, for example, 
one of the things that they're trying to do today is to say that Rana Pratap won the battle of Haldi Ghati and the Mughal army was defeated. Now, you have to go on insisting on saying, what is your evidence for saying that? No? Maybe, I mean, if you have the evidence, put it forward. Let's look at the evidence and let's question the evidence. So evidence is absolutely crucial. And evidence has to be reliable. That's the main thing. Not any bit of uh, story goes as evidence. The evidence has to be tested, has to be reliable as historical evidence. So the main thing is, again, what I was saying, don't just listen to whatever's told to you. Question it. Doubt it. Question it and ask for the evidence. Romila, may I add a line? I think uh, the, the idea of safeguarding uh, creates a problem. I don't think uh, whether it's history or culture, another word we love, uh, needs to be protected. Um, you need to hear as many voices as possible and you need debate. So I think because uh, we are so obsessed with authority, I don't think we should set up an alternative canon either. You know, I think that's why we're talking about questioning and so on. Yes, I, I think that that's very important. Uh, the more you debate and discuss issues that keep coming up all the time on this history and that history, it's got to be debated. That's the important thing. That's the only way you can uh, protect some semblance of what might be good history. Yes, um, Madam, uh, that is a general question regarding the critical relationship between history and uh, literature. Uh, can literature be considered as a source in the process of historiography? Is it possible to consider literature as a, a source in the process of historiography? How far it would be valid if it is become? Well, very briefly, um, that's exactly what I tried to do in my book on Shakuntala, where I took Shakuntala is a purely fictional character. She has absolutely no basis in history that we know of so far. Um, and there are different versions of the story, which is what makes it very interesting. There's the epic version, there's the Kalidas version, there's a, there's a, a, a 17th century Braj Bhasha version. And then there are translations of the Sanskrit version in English, German, French, and then all the European languages, and then all the regional languages of India. So my question was that if this is fiction, I'm not saying that this event actually happened or that this background actually took place, um, but I am, as a historian, saying approximately what period was this version written? And does it give us some idea of what the general background may have been at that time? What I mean by this is that if you compare, for example, the epic version of the story with the Kalidas version, the epic version is one in which she's a very forthright young woman who comes out and tells him what she really thinks of him. Okay. She may be in love with him, but this is not going to carry her away in any way. And when she takes the child to the court, they settle down to an abusing match. And the abuse is really quite impressive. I mean, it's in the Mahabharata, but nevertheless, um, they abuse each other. And then finally, she says, uh, I don't care. I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to leave the child here. You do what you like. You make him your successor or not. I'm going. And then this celestial voice comes in and says, she's telling the truth. Now, in the Kalidas version, it's a different story. She's, um, she's not a feisty young woman who's more or less saying to him, you know, to hell with you and I'll do what I want to do kind of thing. But she gives in to him, more or less all the time, uh, right until the last, they're separated, she goes, she's about to have the child and she goes to the court and he throws her out because he doesn't recognize her, the ring he'd given her gets lost, so he loses his memory of her and so on. 
And in the last scene, um, when he is going through the ashram of, of, uh, of the Rishi Marich and on his way back from a campaign, he sees the child and talks to the child and suddenly it turns out that it's his child. Now, the whole sort of ambience, the background to the Kalidas version is a very um, beautifully sophisticated, poetic version um, in which the, the, the relationships are much more in nuanced than they are in the epic, where in the epic, they're very direct. And then when you look at the Braj Bhasha version, um, it goes back to the epic tradition because it cuts out the ring and all the curse and all the rest of it. And there you have, you know, this young woman from the village who's a no-nonsense woman. And it comes through beautifully in the Braj Bhasha tradition. And it's quite different in a way from the Kalidas tradition. Now, that made me think that, you know, even in fiction, um, you don't take it literally and say this is exactly as it was in the very early period and then in the Gupta period and then in the 17th century. But it does give you a little idea of possible differences that may have a, a historical background as the reason for the differences. And therefore, I am certainly somebody who thinks that the historian should read literature and should try and bring literature into at least the margins of the kind of analysis that the historian is doing. But Romana, in the Braj Basha version, is she less of a vessel for the uh, exposition of lineage? Because in, in the Kalidas version, that's very clear. She's only there to be the mother of. No, in, in the Braj Bhasha version, it's really much more a kind of, um, we're all having fun together, <laughs> and we're calling each other names and that kind of thing. No, the lineage thing is not so important. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, you have wrote a lot about ancient India. Uh, here. You have wrote a lot about ancient India. Recently, our Prime Minister claimed in Parliament that democracy was practiced in ancient India. There are similar arguments in national history books that some sort of uh, democracy was practiced in India. What is your take on this? The, the crucial point is some sort of democracy. What sort of democracy? To say nothing of India. <laughs> to say nothing of India. Yeah. Look, um, true democracy as we understand it means what? It means that every citizen of the state is a participant in the decisions that are made. Whatever the channels may be, parliament or this or that or whatever it may be, but every citizen has the right to make a statement on what is being said. All right. Now, we've all been brought up on the idea that <clears throat> democracy was born in Athens. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, talk about the truth being maligned, but still, this is all part of European nationalism of the 18th, 19th century. You know, The Greeks and the Romans were the ideal society. Therefore, democracy, which was important in Europe in the 18th century, had to be traced back to the golden age of the Greeks. So it was Athens. Now, what happened in Athens was that it was only the free person who was given the rights of democracy. Um, the free citizen, the, the free member of the state of Attica, Athens. The others were all slaves or semi-slaves. And the percentage of the free citizen to the slave was one is to two and one is to three in some cases. So the overwhelming majority of the population in the city-state of Attica uh, were not free, and there wasn't a democracy. The democracy was only amongst a few people. Now, similarly, in the Indian situation, you do have what are called the Gana Sanghas, um, as against the kingdoms, the Rajya is the kingdom, the Gana Sangha is a government by the heads of the clans who sit together in assembly and make decisions. Now, this is still not taking in the Dasa, 
who is the guy who is your potter and your artisan and your ironsmith and the person who is cultivating the fields of the Kshatriya clans. They have no say in all of this. So this is not democracy. And even the people who are actually carrying out the laws in the Gana Sangha are there by birth because they belong to the Kshatriya clan. It's not as if, you know, everybody has a right to sit in the assembly and to speak. So to say that there was democracy in ancient India is certainly not a historically tenable statement. Democracy is a modern idea and it comes together with the whole baggage of including everybody in human rights, human rights itself, what do human rights mean, and the equal status of every human being in a particular state. Madam, I think, um, Madam, as you said, the genetically dilute the, or pollute the Chandal is a concocted version of the and strategic strategy for establishing a permanent workforce. Hmm. So as a member, as one of among the subaltern, I would like to be a rather a genetically modified subaltern without any genetic pollution. What is your take on it? I'm sorry, how would you do that? If by a I mean, no, no. I mean, yes, you, you can be a subaltern without pollution, yes. No. But then you have to uh, make a, a statement to that effect. We have it in our constitution. It's a question of making it effective in society. Not, not by, the, by the crisper gene technology of gene editing. No, no, because there's no truth to any gene being polluted. When I'm saying genetic pollution, all I'm saying is that by birth, they are supposed to be polluted. But this has got nothing to do with genes. There is no connection at all. <laughs> yes, in, 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 intermarriage would take care of that. There's no connection at all between yeah, genes yes, and pollution. Just one last question, because I hear music and clearly it's time for us to go dance. Yes, the, uh, the, the one next. Yeah. Um, uh, so when it comes to making uh, movies based on history, uh, where do you think a filmmaker should draw the line between using their creative freedom and um, anachronisms? This is, of course, linked with the question about uh, literature, because I assume you're thinking of Padmavat. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just to add to a question. I would love to enjoy Sanjay Bansali's films as something, as just an aesthetic movie, but I have this sort of anxiety about how it's being consumed by the public, where uh, maybe it, se sorry, it seeps into their subconsciousness and people start justifying certain practices. So do you have the same sort of anxiety or worry uh, regarding historical films? I have a tremendous anxiety. <clears throat> she enjoys the Bansali's film. <laughs> We're just being mischievous. We're having anxiety about your enjoying Bansali's film. <laughs> but uh, quite seriously, I have a lot of anxiety about how the present is using the past. And the use of the past in the present is huge because there are so many ways in which the past can be drawn into the present and be used. Films is one, novels is another. I mean, we have plenty of novels that claim to be historical fiction and yet, you know, are playing with the idea that this may also be history and various other things. Um, I mean, history comes into things like folk tales, epics, songs that are sung, and whatnot. Um, how do you make a distinction? Maybe every filmmaker should do what the filmmaker did when he, I've forgotten who it was, made a film on Ashoka, the Mauryan king, which, which was complete fantasy. And he said so that this film is not based on historical research, it is entirely fictional. Now, if it's his view, his idea of an event or a person from the past, I can't say, no, you can't do it. 
He's got as much right as anybody else. So he does it. But he must make it clear that it is not historically proven. It is fictional. That is, that is very important. That distinction has to be made. As indeed in all my studies of Shakuntala, in no case is anyone saying that this is actually what happened in the past. They're all saying this is a story that's come down to us and we're revamping the story. Okay. I mean, the Braj Bhasha version is an absolute revamp. And if Padmavat wants to be a revamp, let it be a revamp. But please state clearly that this has absolutely no historical fact. But the story of uh, the, the problem, of course, is now I don't know since I was not living in previous centuries. Did this also happen in the past that people took a story from the past and passed it off somehow in a fashion in the present, which appealed to them and which also gave them what they were looking for? I mean, Every time you use the past to make a statement about the present, you have a reason for using it. And usually it's a political statement or a social statement or a religious statement, but you have a reason for using it. Now, maybe this did happen in the past and those bits and pieces haven't survived. And what is happening now is simply a continuation of that. But there has to be an awareness, not only among historians, but in the general public. That is the important issue. There has to be an awareness that is this claiming to be history or is this claiming to be fiction? That awareness and difference is very important in the general public. But perhaps having said that, we should add that um, if you want to disagree with a particular version, there are ways of disagreement, uh, sort of rational ways of debating. Yeah. Uh, it, you cannot hold a, yeah. an entire society to ransom. You cannot ban, yeah. you know, and that sort of thing. I yeah. think that's important to add. You don't have to stone a, a bus carrying school children, little school children, in order to make your point. There are other ways of making your point. I think we'll um, thank you so much, Romila. Um, I was hoping we'd end on the note of uh, uh, what might be democracy for us today, since we don't uh, see it in the face. But what, what might this creature be? But we are ending, sadly, as always, with something Bollywood has given us. But thank you so much for joining us.